Welcome everyone to this educational program brought to you by the Light Brigade and hosted by Lightwave Online. My name is Jim Clodfelter and I'm the marketing manager with the Light Brigade. I want to thank Stephen Hardy and his entire team for making this platform available. This is the first in a series of webinars that are based on our comprehensive fiber optic training programs and we hope that they enlighten you about key topics and concerns within the industry today. Your instructor today is going to be Cameron Karsh, and I will turn the platform over to him in a minute, but I want to take care of a couple of housekeeping things first. For your convenience, this presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours after we conclude today. You can reach it at uh, www.lightwaveonline.com. You'll also get a reminder email uh, following this event. We encourage you to ask questions using the Ask question button uh, that you should see on the left-hand side of the screen. I'd like to answer those questions at the end of the presentation, but please, whenever you feel you have a question, go ahead and, and present it to us. Uh, if you have a technical support issue, things aren't working for you correctly, you can alert us through this question box as well. We will not be identifying who's asking the questions to keep your anonymity, but please feel free to ask whatever you need. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Cameron, who is our presenter today. Hello, everyone. This is uh, Cameron Karsh with the Light Brigade. Um, we uh, we have a, about the Light Brigade was founded back in 1986. Um, since the 87, there's been 45,000 trained in the fiber optic. Um, myself, I've been dealing with fiber optics since 1987 as well. Um, our strengths here, our staff is very good with a lot of experience. We have a wide variety of um, people who instruct for us who have all several years of, uh, of experience. Our content has been developed by an excellent development staff uh, through extensive research over the years. Um, what we're going to talk about today, again, is the uh, fiber types um, over the years that have been developed and what they're used for. So let's get started. Here we have our single mode fiber. Now single mode fiber, as you can see, has a very high bandwidth, um, between two to 500 terahertz obtainable down a single mode fiber. Um, so extremely large bandwidth, and that's uh, through, through multiplexing as well, um, can send a massive amount of data down to a single fiber. We have very low attenuation uh, with this. We're looking at, uh, on the slide here, 0.2 to 0.4 dB per kilometer. So dependent upon wavelength utilized, um, like 15, 50 nanometers, for example, um, you're, you're usually slated at 0.25 dB per kilometer or less. Although you can get fibers that are ultra low loss that are down in the 0.16 to 0.17 dB per kilometer. Um, the 0.4 would be for 1310 nan nanometers. Uh, the shorter wavelength uh, has a higher intrinsic loss due to absorption and scattering. Um, usually you're looking at specifications of around 0.35 dB per kilometer or less today, um, testing at about 0.3, 0.32 in that area. Uh, we use lasers, you know, distributed feedbacks, Fabry Pro lasers, and of course, um, for multi-mode, we'll discuss a, a pixel laser. Um, but again, high high data rates, um, high powered uh, devices. Everything for single mode though does cost a little more money. The tolerances when you're dealing with a plus or minus nine micron uh, mode field diameter core for single mode, the tolerances for the connectors have got to be extremely stringent, extremely tight. Um, when you're trying to line up that small of a core, you know, we'll look at a slide later on that shows us if we're just one micron misaligned, that can be a 10% loss of power. Um, test equipment again, fusion splicers, OTRs, transmitters and receivers um, for single mode again, all, uh, all cost a little more money obviously than multi-mode. Uh, so where are we going to use single mode? Typically in, uh, in the outside plant world, we can, we can use it for the premises application if uh, bandwidth requires, but we'll talk about some laser optimized fibers for that. Transmit one mode, which a mode is a light path, and that's as long as you stay above what we call the cutoff wavelength of single mode fiber. Uh, anything transmitted below that can uh, definitely cause problems. Operates at 1310 nanometers, uh, which is the O band, original band, and of course 1550, which is your conventional band. There are, there are other wavelengths, as you can see on the board there, such as 1625. Also for FTTX applications, we're looking at 1490 as well, too. But realistically, from, 
from 1271 all the way up to, you know, 1611 could be a coarse wavelength division multiplexing, or if it's dense wavelength, uh, you know, you're, you're usually focusing the C band 1530 to 1565 nanometers with that. And single mode is definitely very sensitive, using the longer wavelengths, and of course, uh, depending on the mode field diameter of the single mode fiber, very sensitive to macro bends and micro bends. A macro bend meaning uh, bend radius of the cable and uh, for storage loops, uh, for splice trays, organization of the jumpers, and of course, uh, micro bends. Uh, to avoid those, we would want to stay away from tie wraps and use a, a Velcro strap for those. So you can see the single mode, very high bandwidth, very low attenuation, excellent for um, pretty much any application. Let's take a look at the next slide now for multi-mode. With a multi-mode fiber, you can see that we have bandwidth up to 4,700 megahertz kilometer. Uh, that is an OM4 fiber. So we're, we're dealing with fibers, and we'll take a look at a specification sheet here that are ranging from um, OM1 up to OM4, uh, 62.5 uh, and to 50 micron fibers. Uh, very, uh, the losses, again, tend to be higher, but again, where do we use multi-mode in the premises uh, environment? The losses of uh, 1 dB per kilometer to 6 dB per kilometer. Um, again, uh, with the fibers we're going to be talking about more so, you're probably looking in the uh, oh, 0.8 to 3.5 dB per kilometer area. Um, core sizes, again, 50 and 62.5. Here in North America, 62.5 has been used for years. It's been pretty much a legacy fiber. Um, now with the focus going more towards 50 micron laser optimized to support the gigabit system. Um, effective again with lasers, uh, such as a low cost of pixel laser, which is a vertical cavity surface emitting laser, uh, or LEDs, which have been used in the past. Um, again, you'll see lasers used more often because LEDs can't modulate at gigabit speeds, typically around 600 megabits. Uh, medium to low cost for components. Again, plus or minus tolerances, a couple microns for multi-mode is not a real big deal uh, when you're trying to line up. And of course, the transmitters and receivers low cost as well. It says distance limitations due to modal dispersion. So this is different paths of light that take different times to reach the detector. You have light that travels in the fundamental modes in the center of the core versus your higher order modes uh, in the in outer portions of the core. and and these. And this entire sum of energy has got to reach the detector before the next presence of light. And um, when you're dealing with hundreds of modes like that, uh, that's going to affect the distances that you can go. Operates at 850 and 1300. And with uh, legacy fibers, we'll take a look at that. That 1300 was the more focused for higher bandwidth, lower attenuation. But again, now that we're doing, doing gigabit uh, supported with the Vixels, um, the 850 is more focused now. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at the uh, OM3 and 4 for that. And of course, easier to splice than single mode. Um, a lot of multi-mode is ran point to point, where um, you know, throw a couple connectors on nowadays using uh, no polish type connectors um, uh, methods. Uh, it can be real quick and easy. So, so there's your multi-mode again, typically used in the premises. So on our next slide is the tolerances here. And you can see that over the years that the tolerances have gotten much better uh, over time. The uh, cladding diameter for single mode fiber prior to 1908, plus or minus three microns, and that was, that's a big deal right there. Cladding diameters after 88 were plus or minus two. And of course now after 93, plus or minus one, we're, we're seeing mode field diameters uh, plus or minus 0.4 to 0.5 uh, microns, um, again, very, very good tight tolerances. On the multi-mode side, you can see that, uh, you know, plus or minus two or three microns, it, tolerances has never been a real big issue for multi-mode there. Um, what you don't want to do, and we'll take a look at that, is, you know, connecting 50 microns to 62.5. That's a different story. Um, about that, uh, when you're splicing older fiber to new fiber, especially when you're using a fixed V-groove alignment splicer, which does not only aligns Z, uh, the, the splice tolerances, again, can be very high loss in one direction. And of course, you could have uh, a parent gainer in another direction with an OTDR. Uh, the core alignment splicers, therefore, are going to be a lot better for trying to align as best as possible. So the bottom line is they're just better at making it today, which makes our life a lot easier when uh, doing splicing. OK. OK, let's go to the next slide here. This here is a. Uh, 
template of uh, the fibers itself. Now you can see on the uh, multi-mode side, uh, they do not specify a mode cell diameter. 100% of the light travels in the multi-mode core. Uh, in fact, if any light gets into the cladding, basically it escapes and it's gone. Uh, but with single mode, they do call out for mode field diameter. So usually when you look at a specification sheet, you're looking at the mode field diameter. Uh, and in this case here, it's showing 9.3 microns, plus or minus uh, 0.5 with that. Now up above, though, you see the OM1, 2, 3, and 4. The OM1 and 2 fibers, those are known as legacy fibers. They've been certified with an LED, built and designed and certified with an LED. And um, with the uh, laser optimized fibers, which is OM3 and 4, just simply they've been built and designed around uh, lasers itself. So with the uh, fours, you see the three, three of the four are going to be uh, 50 micron. And of course, the uh, legacy OM1, 6, and 2.5. Single mode again using mode field diameter. Now the Attenuation for the fibers, as you can see on the, let's take a look at the, the legacy OM1 fiber. We're looking at 3.5 dB per kilometer uh, maximum attenuation. By increasing the wavelength and going with 1300, that basically decreased by a couple dB per kilometer. So now you're looking at 1.5 dB per kilometer. And if you take a look at the bandwidth for OM1, at 850, we're looking at 160 megahertz kilometer. And of course, 1300 uh, increasing to 500 megahertz kilometers. So, as you can see there, that's letting you know that the uh, the bandwidth is actually tuned for 1300 nanometers. On the OM2, you're getting lower attenuation, uh, two and a half dB per kilometer versus 0.8, and of course, the bandwidth 600 megahertz kilometer, and going increasing to 1300 at 1000 megahertz kilometers. So that uh, going by the smaller core and a longer wavelength from both those examples increased our bandwidth and, of course, decreased our attenuation. Uh, on OM3 and 4, if you notice that the attenuation is looking right at 2.3 dB per kilometer at 850 and 0.6, but if you look at the bandwidth, this is where you can see that these fibers are actually tuned for 850 nanometers. And this is to help, um, you know, function with the lower cost pixel lasers, for example. You look at OM3 at 2,000 megahertz kilometer, and uh, if we just did a one-to-one -one coding scheme, which I know isn't normal, but if we took a 2,000 megahertz kilometer, that tells you in in two kilom in, in uh, 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 one gigabit can actually support up to two kilometers with that. Um, so simply just dividing that, the OM4 at 4,700 megahertz kilometer. So, well, I guess one question you'd need to ask yourself when purchasing one of these is uh, do you plan on doing 10 gig sooner than later or are you going to stick with a gigabit for a while? That could make a difference uh, on which fiber you really wanted to purchase. Um, looking at the single mode one, you'll see the attenuation uh, 1300, since the single mode will say 1310, uh, at 0.4 dB per kilometer. And a lot of the specification sheets I've seen recently are usually 0.35 or less dB per kilometer. By increasing the uh, wavelength going with 1550. The slide says 0.3, but usually you're looking at 0.25 or less dB per kilometer with that. Um, but you'll notice that the fiber we're talking about right now, jumping down to dispersion, is uh, actually optim optimized for 1310 nanometers. So we're looking at 3.2 picoseconds per nanometer kilometer versus on 1550, 17 uh, picoseconds per nanometer kilometer. So if we if we did, let's make my math easy and do a 10 kilometer run, we had factoring in what the relative dispersion of 3.2 picoseconds, uh, if I went 10 kilometers, that would be a total of 32 picoseconds of dispersion. Of course, we don't know what the spectral width of the laser is, but I'm just calculating what your fiber's uh, dispersion would be. Uh, versus if you went with 1550 to get lower attenuation on the standard single mode fiber, you're actually taking a dispersion penalty of uh, almost six times the uh, dispersion. So at 17 picoseconds, let's say that 10 kilometers again, that would be a total of 170 picoseconds of dispersion. So the point here is really if you're going to switch, going to stick with the standard G.652 fiber, uh, and when I say G.652, this is an ITU standard um, to make sure the dispersion characteristics are compatible one with the other. But uh, by 
using that fiber, going with a longer wavelength, if you were going any great distances there, you do need to keep in mind of the dispersion. But we'll, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the uh, chat. Okay, so let's go to the next one here. These are multimode legacy fibers. And you can see here that the legacy multimode fibers are designed with LEDs. So, and of course, LEDs, like I said before, do an overfilled launch condition. They just flood the entire core with light. So, in the uh, earlier years when we used a lot of LEDs, it was very important where if you had a, you know, OM1 fiber um, uh, for your system that called out for 62.5, or if you were running a 62.5 and you put an OM2 in, a 50 micron, you, you're going to lose about 2.5 to 3 dB of power right off the bat. So, you really don't want to mismatch the glass up. Um, but again, it shows here the, uh, the attenuation and bandwidth was optimized for 1300 on those. Okay. Now, this slide here, basically, let's, let's say we have already in our infrastructure right now, we have an existing OM1 fiber. So again, being uh, 62.5, 125, OM1 based on 160 megahertz kilometer versus 500 megahertz kilometer. So the question here is, all right, I'm running 100 gigabit right now, and everything's working just fine. But we, we're, we're going to get a, a 100 megabit, and everything's running fine, and we're going to get a gigabit switch. The question is, can we still utilize the existing infrastructure, or do we have to replace it all? And it's kind of a yes and no answer. If you look at the graph itself, you're looking at the data rate vertically, which is, uh, again, 1 gigabit versus distance support horizontally. And if you just take a look at the 850, if you were to use an 850 Vixel, for example, you're looking at roughly around 225 meters, according to the graph. Um, of course, at 1,300, if we went that way, we're looking at right around 550 meters. So if your runs exceeded that 225 meters, um, basically you could use them as a pull cord and pull in a 50 micron laser optimized. Um, that would be um, one of your options there, or again, if you just replaced all of them. But, but the answer is you don't necessarily have to. As long as your network's short enough, and uh, which a lot of premises probably would be, you could still utilize that existing fiber. Okay. This, again, with the multi-mode fiber bandwidth, this is a, a restricted mode launch, again, is certifying fibers for laser applications, uh, finding the effective modal bandwidth. Uh, the, the graph here shows that these fibers over there are actually tuned to 1300, if you can see that. But down with the OM3 and 4 fibers, again, uh, as we already reviewed over, they, they are actually tuned for the 850. So we got higher attenuation at 850, but again, to keep uh, the transmission equipment low cost, um, these fibers uh, can optimize for the, uh, for the 850 window. Okay? And this is just showing us uh, an overfilled launch condition again. It shows here that LEDs flood the entire core with photons. So, um, you know, if you take a look at the specifications, they kind of, um, you know, the bigger the core, the more power was launched into the fiber. But there you go again, the bigger the core, the less the bandwidth capacity and the higher the attenuation of the fiber. So, so bigger cores uh, definitely aren't the way to go. But this is the typical uh, OM, one fiber, 62.5, 125, about 160 um, megahertz kilometer, 850 and 500. Okay. This is showing us restricted mode launch. So, um, Using laser diodes with basically for gigabit transmission, again, because LEDs can't support it, they fill up a minor percentage. So what this technique allows for is the higher bandwidth using the low-cost pixels here. So over on the right side, you see that it shows that new systems and fibers require new measurement uh, standards to address the bandwidth using RML technique. And on this slide, we're seeing a uh, two, fi uh, two fibers being tested, one on the left-hand side being good versus the one on the right-hand side being not as, uh, not as uh, high of a quality. So remember, these laser-optimized fibers were designed for use at 850 nanometers to match the launch conditions of the vertical cavity surface emitting laser, optimized again to control differential mode delay at data rates up to 10 gig. So on the left-hand side of the chart, you're seeing that the mask is consistent from the outer edge of the core through the center to the opposite outer edge of the core. 
we're on the right hand side of the slide, it's uh, inconsistent. Okay. Now, let's go to the next slide. And of course, this one's used by manufacturer. This is called in circled flux launch condition. So this seems to be the uh, most accurate test determining the uh, bandwidth attenuation for multimode fibers. It's the means of characterizing uh, the modal filling for VIXL sources when they're coupled into the OM3 or OM4 type fibers. It is a more complex and stringent than the overfilled launch condition or the restricted mode launch. Uh, again, based on measurements of the near field output. So again, this is how they uh, certify these laser optical fibers. Okay, moving on. And this is going to show you here that the OM1 and 2 fibers you can see are, are peaked at the 1300, but OM3 and 4 are peaked at the 850, and you can tell from the uh, design. So again, designed to work for pixels, low cost pixels. Uh, bandwidth again, optimized for 850. Again, we do take higher attenuation hit at about 2.5 dB per kilometer. Um, but again, we're we'll to support your one up to 10 gig uh, for the future here as well. So it shows here specified again by the IEC 60793 and TIA 4927. Okay. So on the bend and multimode fibers, as you can see here, on the OM1 and 2 fibers, we have a, uh, a uh, fiber with a center line dip. So when the fiber is bent, you can leak the outer modes you can get into the cladding. And again, once they get into the cladding, they're escaped and they're lost. So with the um, bend and sensitive, you can see it creates a reflective barrier right outside the core reed. So what that's going to do is keep the light trapped in that core better. And, and uh, this is going to be specified in the future releases of the TIA 492 and uh, also the IEC um, standards as well. Okay, so those are the multi-mode fibers. Let's talk a little bit about single-mode fibers now. And that would bring us into the different generations of single-mode. We have our first generation fiber, which is uh, all built around 1310, so it's considered a single window fiber at 3.2 picoseconds per nanometer kilometer. So let's take a look at the second generation, which is our standard single mode fiber. So remember, it's an ITU standard, so I'm just going to say G.652. It's much easier to, to just say that real quick. And it is optimized, as you can see, for 1310, but again, can be usable at 1550. So if you look at the dispersion here, remember, 1310 has a higher attenuation back then at you know 0.4 or so dB per kilometer. 1550 being at 0.3 or so dB per kilometer. But the for long distances, this, this dispersion increased from 3.2 picosecond all the way up to 17 picosecond. So when you were doing long haul applications or any kind of multiplexing, um, the dispersion definitely needs to be considered with this. There's another uh, uh, improvement on this fiber that we'll talk about in just a second. The third generation was uh, again dispersion shifted and what they did is they shifted the zero dispersion point over at 1550 and it's almost like they made this fiber too good because at a single wavelength when you were transmitting longer longer distances you had the best of both worlds you had the lowest attenuation wavelength that you could use now and you had the lowest dispersion it was optimized for 1550 once they, as you see up above, it says could not be used for DWDM. So once they actually started doing multiplexing on this fiber, um, weird occurrences basically occurred, like four-wave mixing and op or, or optical beading, which um, basically would produce false wavelengths and uh, still power from the operating ones. So, so what they had to do is they had to rethink this fiber. And in the 90s, they obsoleted this, and they went with this fiber. Okay, which is, is called a non-zero dispersion shifted fiber. So by adding some positive dispersion to this particular fiber, um, now it created a perfect long haul one. It um, was um, ideal for multiplexing and for so like when we're doing dense wavelength division multiplexing, you could send 40 lambdas through the uh, system. You could send 80 lambdas and uh, you wouldn't get this uh, any kind of optical beating effect. So it's perfect for long haul, single wavelength, or multiplexing right there. As you can see up above the wavelength, 
1550 and 1625. You got to be real careful with some of these uh, non-zero dispersion shifted fibers because you might run into a cutoff wavelength of say 1450 nanometers, which means it will not work at 1310. It basically will um, not be a good thing. Uh, turn it into a multi-mode fiber, basically. Um, the 1625 again would be used for testing and monitoring, handshaking, whatever the case is with that. So, so again, uh, fiber designed for um, uh, longer distance applications and multiplexing applications. Um, of course, going back to the um, next slide here, there we go. We've got the different fiber types we just discussed. We talked about the G.652. Um, we're going to talk about the G.652D in this very next slide, so bear with me here. Uh, we talked about G.653, how it needed to be obsoleted, and of course the G.655 non-zero dispersion shift of fiber. Um, worked out for it. So on the next slide is the D version. Here you go. We got a G.652D shows here designed to minimize attenuation and open up CWDM wavelengths in the E band. So the CWDM, uh, first of all the attenuation at 1385 nanometer center wavelength, we had this high OH level, um, hydroxyl ions, which basically created a lot of intrinsic attenuation into the fiber. So um, if you have the older version fiber, because realistically, I mean, me, myself, personally, I, I saw the G.652D really starting to take over in around the early 2000 years. Um, not that it wasn't uh, around a little bit, but really start to, manufacturers started to, to dr stop making the standard G.652A and incorporating the G.652D. So we really need to physically document where all this fiber is because if you're testing a, a standard single mode fiber, for example, uh, A version or a D, typical wavelengths you're testing at are 1310 and 1550. Um, you're not even going to know you have a problem of, in the OH at 1385 until you actually started running CWDM. The, the course wavelength takes place from 1271 nanometers all the way up to 1611 and that 20 nanometer spacing, so a total of 18 wavelengths. So if you have all D version fiber, you can accomplish those 18 total wavelengths with no problem at all. It's the A version, whether you have A spliced to D or just all A version fiber, there's basically four wavelengths in that E band that uh, you'll probably end up staying away from uh, because of the high attenuation. Not that you couldn't really use them, but if you could take 2 dB of loss per kilometer, which most of you can't, um, you could probably get away with it. So, so if you have the older version fiber, there's still 14 available uh, cost-effective wavelengths to use, at least, and uh, the D version opens up all 18 channels. So there's, there's the difference between those. Okay, so look at the next slide here. This is showing us a long-haul or DWDM technology. Uh, it shows increased signal capacity of single mode networks operating at 1550 window. So again, the C band, which you're seeing on the next line, is typically 1530 to 1565 nanometers. Um, it shows here an EDFA, which is an erbium dope fiber amplifier. What this can do is if you're sending 40 lambdas through your network multiplexing, it can, and you're, you are losing power and you need to amplify only. Now, this only amplifies, it doesn't regenerate. But this will amplify all 40 wavelengths um, simultaneously as they go through. So if they come in good and clean, they're going to leave clean, just more powerful. Um, if it's a dispersion issue, then we need to compensate for that dispersion, which we'll uh, show you one of the methods uh, here pretty shortly. The uh, G.655 fiber here, again, uh, adds a small amount of positive, or you can get negative uh, dispersion as well, too, um, at 1550 allowing for all channels to move slightly different speeds. So again, no, uh, no, no four-way mixing or optical beating effects with that. Um, so uh, one, one word here is that some of this bend in sensitive fiber, when you do splice to a standard G.652 fiber, uh, a lot of times you will get like a weld scene in the screen of the splicer. And that's uh, because of the makeup of the bend in sensitive fiber is entirely different than that of the 652. Uh, which again leaves uh, a little slight flaw in your splice. I mean, afterwards, when we're done splicing standard fiber to standard, it looks perfect. Well, with this bend and sensitive standard, you'll tend to 
get that little weld seam, but again, it will test just fine normally with that. Okay, moving on. Now, here's your dispersion for single mode. We've got our um, um, signal spreading. It says cause when portions of the signal that launch together do not arrive together. So remember, again, it's that, that basic binary. Uh, the entire sum of energy has got to reach to the detector and uh, uh, before the next sum of energy. And you're showing here a couple types of dispersion, chromatic dispersion, which you can see here uh, shows material dispersion affected by the spectral width of the laser, and then, of course, waveguide dispersion affected by the index of the of refraction of the core versus the cladding. Okay, remember, with single mode, not 100% of the light will travel in the core alone. We actually utilize the inner portion of the cladding. Now, this is called the mode field diameter for single mode fibers. And with this mode field diameter, will vary between wavelengths. Um, take, for example, a standard G.652D fiber. Um, you're looking usually at a right around 9.2 microns as a mode field diameter for 1310. And by increasing the wavelength to 1550, you're looking at 10.4 microns approximately for the mode field diameter at there. That's another one of the reasons why the 1550, again, being a longer wavelength and utilizing a larger mode field diameter, a lot more sensitive to uh, microbends and mac macrobends. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Now, of course, um, with the, uh, again, uh, fiber being optimized between, you know, G.652 uh, at uh, 1310 versus a G.655 at 1550. There's another dispersion there. Again, now the chromatic dispersion, keep in mind, is constant. So once you do a fiber characterization, for example, that number is pretty well fixed and uh, isn't going to change. But on the other hand, this polarization mode dispersion is. Now with the chromatic dispersion, we can compensate that for that, and we'll talk about that. But for the um, on the polarization mode dispersion, there is PMD fibers out there, but the PMD effects can be totally random. As you can see, affected by by Vibrations. If you don't put up your, your um, you know, proper um, vibration suppressors on aerial or you know, the, a cable that could possibly be buried along railroad tracks, um, the vibrations can actually affect the core. Which again, the ovality of the core is the issue. If the core was perfectly round, you wouldn't have uh, really much PMD effects at all. You'd you'd have that electrical field would arrive with the optical field. But but with stresses and vibrations. Uh, known as birefringence, bi that can can cause the core to get more of an ovality shape to it. And what's going to happen, now your X and Y axis is not going to be taking the same uh, same route. There, one's going to be traveling, well, a further distance, which is going to cause that PMD effect to spread out. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Those PMD problems are usually going to start hitting you or need to start addressing them right at about two and a half uh, gigabits, but definitely in the 10 and 40 and 100 gigabit stages with those. Okay, so now on the dispersion here, it's showing how are we going to uh, basically correct that dispersion. And here is one method called uh, DCF fiber. Now this is a dispersion compensating fiber, and, and just like it says up above, it is application specific optical fiber. So you just can't take a random compensator, put it anywhere, and then uh, expect it to work. You would need to do a fiber characterization, uh, characterizing all your fibers and seeing, uh, again, what you're going to be doing with it, your distance, um, the dispersion uh, at the um, single mode at 17 picoseconds or any other fiber, um, and it would have to be specially made. Um, this, this basically shows it's designed with a high negative dispersion, and it compensates for the uh, large amounts of uh, positive dispersion in the fiber. So typically that's what we're, we're dealing with. So remember, standard single mode fiber is optimized at 1310. Taking that 17 picosecond dispersion penalty at 1550 on a standard, uh, depending on the distance, depending on the multiplexing, depending on the data rate, it's going to have to be compensated for with that. Now, when using these specific modules, though, you really need to be careful and calculate your attenuation budget. Can these uh, be used without amplifiers, if we need amplifiers, you're looking at roughly about a half a dB per kilometer of attenuate, intrinsic attenuation uh, with these particular modules themselves. So 
So again, um, one thing to consider um, if it needs to be uh, compensated for or not. Okay, and of course, what type of compensator you're going to use. All right. So moving right along here, we'll uh, come into color coding. Of course, now all fibers have uh, a color code to them. This is the North American Standard color code. Uh, blue, orange, green, brown, slate, white, red, black, yellow, violet. You notice those are actually the communication color code in, in, uh, in copper. The first five were actually the, um, the ring colors in the telephone color code, and the next five were actually the tip colors in the telephone color code. Um, now, of course, the, you got the rose and aqua, which are the, the colors, the, the extra two colors down below. So uh, important to know these colors um, for the uh, installers, that is. And of course, if you're engineering a job, you're dropping fibers off at locations, you need to make sure that we uh, match up. Well, not all the colors will match up, but they'll be used in these specific ones to uh, let the uh, technician what he's supposed to slice in. Now, typically, uh, these are going to be, uh, if for outdoor cable, these are the uh, 250 micron diameter coating. And for indoor, there'll be a uh, 200 and, uh, I mean, 900 micron color. Oh, yes. And, of course, with the uh, color code here, a lot of manufacturers will, will usually put a clear coating of 245 microns. So when it's outdoor cable, they'll apply five microns of color. It's usually a UV uh, process, a curing process. And if it's indoor, they'll bump those those uh, coatings up to a 900 micron tight buffer coating. So there's two ways to buffer. Loose buffer for outdoor, which is going to be 250 coat of fiber. Tight buffer normally for indoor or indoor-outdoor, which is normally going to be a 900 micron tight buffer coating. Uh, down below, though, where you see the internal buffer tubes and twines, uh, the same color. So if there are, say, 24 fibers in one tube, for example, the first 12 would be these solid colors. Um, and then the second 12, 13 through 24, would normally have a little black dash on them. So the black fiber would usually be a clear coated fiber with a black dash. Um, or if they use colored twines, the first 12 will have a blue twine loosely wrapped around it. And of course, fibers 13 through 24, the second um, 12, would have a orange string wrapped around it. So that's how they go about color coding and central tube design um, with that. Okay. And of course, when it comes to ribbon, you can see we can, uh, at high counts, normally when we're looking at 288 and above, we can get ribbon fibers in 96 count and lower, no problem. But usually when you're dealing with that 288 count and above, you're specific, pretty much specifically dealing with ribbon. Um, you know, like 864 counts, 1152 counts um, are going to be all ribbon. Now remember, there's only 12 colors in the color code. So in this case here, let's say in the picture, let's say it's a 144 fiber ribbon cable. The ribbons themselves, the matrix, would usually have a 1 dash blue stamped on it, a 2 dash orange, 3 dash green, and so on. So that tells me what group of 12 and what order it goes into. And then, of course, we have machines that can splice um, 12 fibers, up to 24 fibers. Uh, standard ribbon splicers are usually a 12 fiber, uh, um, up to a 12 fiber at once uh, splicing with that. So when you do that they usually have a matrix and then of course the color coded fibers underneath that matrix with that. So the tolerances obviously have got to be extremely tight, which nowadays are excellent. All the manufacturers are excellent making these uh, fibers and keeping within tolerance there. Okay. So so on this particular slide here, this is going to be uh, our ending slide. And uh, what we're, what we're doing here is um, basically putting yourself in the box. What's your application? So if you're a submarine application, you know, what type of fiber are you going to generally use? You're going to use a non-zero dispersion shifted fiber, typically, um, something that's optimized, again, for 1550, lowest attenuation, and, of course, the highest bandwidth for, for that particular uh, application there. And, of course, lots of multiplexing as well, too. So the long haul, again, would generally use a non-zero dispersion G.655 fiber, something, again, optimized for um, 1550 nanometers, low dispersion, low attenuation. 
On the short haul, you're normally going to see a standard G.652D fiber now, or it could be an existing G.652A. But with, uh, with the short haul, if you're going to be doing nothing but multiplexing, you could actually get a combination of a non-zero dispersion shifted G.655 and a G.652, just in separate bu buffer tubes of that. Now, again, can we do multiplexing on a standard G.652D fiber? Absolutely we can. It's that dispersion, remember at 17 picoseconds per nanometer kilometer, that would have to be um, taken a look at to see if it was going to affect us or not. So that's your short haul. Generally a G.652D, uh, but could be a G.655 if needed. Now on the subscriber side, uh, then they're going to definitely be using the G.652D from what I've seen. Um, again, something that, remember, with the subscriber, you know, they, uh, say a BPON application where they might send 1490 for voice and data downstream and 1550 for video downstream and that's downstream to your home and then from your home back upstream you'd be inserting 1310 nanometers for voice and data to communicate back and forth. So on the subscriber part they're using pretty much um, most of the spectrum there is, is from, from the 1310 all the way up to that 1550. So again, a standard G.652D type fiber would be used in those applications typically. Uh, when it comes to in the building itself, we've got uh, usually the OM1, OM2, OM3, or OM4 fiber now. Again, what are you doing with it? If we're going to be going gigabit application with that, the um, fibers, in the premises, we want an OM3 or OM4. We want something that's optimized for um, um, 13, I mean, excuse me, for 850 nanometers uh, for the low cost pixels and that can uh, accomplish some good data rate. Um, you know, sooner or later, we pretty don't even want to really consider an OM1 fiber anymore um, with the uh, pixels that could obsolete the LEDs and uh, the OM3 and 4 fibers supporting our, um, our uh, um, gigabit application. So, uh, so as you can see, you pretty much select your, select your box, put your stuff in the box, and uh, see what happens with that. Um, okay, guys, this is uh, question and answer time here. Let's see if we have any questions. Okay, um, so I have another question here that says, do I need a CD test on my fiber? It is not, oh, okay. Well, the, the, a lot of times, again, uh, they, they'll do a, a chromatic uh, fiber characterization, and what this does is it just goes through, say, if you're multiplexing, if you're, especially in the coarse wavelength division multiplexing, let's say, where you're utilizing from 1271 all the way up to 1611, um, depending on what your data rates and everything, you might need to do a calculation on each individual wavelength because when you're looking at 1271, obviously your dispersion is going to be the lowest versus 1611, your dispersion is going to be the highest. So that would really depend on the distance that you're running and, of course, the data rate that you're running in the system. Like I said, based off the fiber specifications, I can do a simple calculation because um, what they give you on the specification sheet is uh, relative dispersion. Uh, to get the absolute dispersion, you would simply go distance times relative dispersion, and that would um, give you those numbers. Uh, the only ones that you normally see, though, in the specification sheet, uh, unless uh, you would could ask for more later, is going to be the 1310 and 1550. Okay. Um, I have another one here that shows what is the cutoff wavelength of fiber. And the cutoff wavelength of the fiber is actually the, the point that you don't want to transmit below. For example, on, example, on a standard single mode fiber, the cutoff wavelength is 1260 nanometers. And um, with the, um, if you were to transmit, let's say you do an 850 VIXEL laser on that single mode fiber, the, um, the multi single mode would turn into really a step index multi mode fiber now and would uh, not be a good idea unless you want to spend a lot of money for nothing. Um, um, this here shows for more information on the topic can be found in our collection of uh, training DVDs which are available and to see a full description and schedule for all the fiber optic classes and materials 
you can download our 2013 catalog um, at Light Brigade. So for any questions here, you can see our phone number, our actual web uh, support, support at lightbrigade.com. You can call us at an 800 number, which is 451-800-451-7128, or um, if it's outside the United States, uh, area code 206-575-0404. And with that, we've come to the end of the program today. Um, if I didn't get a chance to ask your questions, I'm sorry about that, but uh, you, in your questions you can view on the webcast from the archives. You can contact the Light Brigade directly via the email address or the phone number that I just told you about. As I mentioned at the start of the, or as we mentioned at the start of the event, the archived version of the webcast will be accessible from LightWave homepage, www.lightwave.com online.com and with that I'd like to thank everyone in our audience for your attention and interest. I hope you'll join us uh, for the next webcast which is March 12th and we'll discuss the important concerns about fiber terminations and connections. Until then have a great day and 